Hi, I'm Frank Diamond, the Managing Editor of Infection Control Today, where we're trying to give infection preventionists and other healthcare professionals the information they need to care for patients with COVID-19 and other dangerous pathogens. Infection control and prevention is a daunting task everywhere in a hospital and with all patients, perhaps, but perhaps it's especially daunting in the neonatal intensive care units. How best to protect those most vulnerable patients? My guest today will talk a little bit about that. Jenny Hayes is an infection preventionist who holds a master's degree in nursing leadership with many years of experience in both clinical nursing and infection prevention. She worked in nearly every healthcare setting which adds to the scope of her practice in infection pre prevention. She currently holds, she currently works at the University of, of Pennsylvania. She serves as one of that organization's infection prevention leaders. Ms. Hayes, thanks for joining us here at Infection Control today. Thank you, Frank. It's a pleasure. Um, thank you for the invitation. Two-part question. Could you tell us a little bit about the challenges of infection prevention in NICUs in general? And has COVID-19 presented a unique challenge there? So in the neonatal intensive care population, um, you can't look at, the, at this population as a single entity. Uh, this is a combined population of maternal health, both uh, prior to birth and after birth. So you have your um, triage for labor and delivery. You have your labor and delivery staff um, and that setting. And then you have the birth of a child who perhaps needs emergent resuscitation, is born prematurely, and needs to go to the infant resuscitation bay, um, and is subsequently admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, once that happens, you still have to have that consideration for the postpartum setting uh, where the mother will be recovering from the delivery. So remembering that delivery can take place as a vaginal birth in a labor and delivery room or perhaps um, in an operating room as a C-section. So both of those settings have unique um, considerations for safety as far as COVID-19. Um, uh, let, 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 let me stop you right there. What are, okay. some, of those, what are some of those unique uh, considerations as far as COVID-19? So um, in labor and delivery, in moms in labor, um, there may be heavy breathing involved. You may have more close contact uh, with the face. Um, perhaps you're holding the patient's hand or assisting them in breathing, um, so it can be a heavier breathing. Uh, asking the patient to wear a mask, which is something that we do do in our facility, can be challenging at that point, especially as labor progresses and you're to the point of pushing. Um, so that right there offers a set of unique challenges for both the patient and the staff in the room. And when you talk about aerosolization, sometimes you're talking about, you know, if perhaps a mom screams during that delivery, she may aerosolize some particles that uh, wouldn't normally take place in a routine patient care um, setting. The patient in labor is going to have unique needs as opposed to the patient who delivers by C-section. Now you're looking in a perioperative setting. Now you um, have to consider the airflow exchange in an operating room. You wanna make sure that you are meeting the correct guidelines for that, the CDC HICPAC guidelines um, that follow the AIC standards, which well, are the greater- let me, let me stop you for a second. This is all very fascinating stuff to me. So we have a lady, we have a woman in labor. She, she, you have to give her a mask because of COVID-19. Right. What about, what about what about the fathers? Because they're often involved in this, are they? In the right. So we allow one partner in the room, uh, one co one coach in the room with the parent. Um, in the past, you could have more than one person, but with COVID-19, we're allowing one person to assist with that labor. And yes, they would be masked as well. So everyone in the room is universally masked. What, what, are, what, are, the, what, are, what are your healthcare workers uh, donned in? I mean, what, how, how are they? How so are they're they... wearing a paper surgical mask and they are wearing a face shield to protect them in addition to the mask because that offers eye protection as well. 
So the point of the mask, I'm sure as you hear in the media, helps you know prevent um, transmission at the source. Okay, so your patient is protecting you by wearing the mask. You're protecting the patient by wearing a mask. The face shield is going to help you um, protect your eyes in have the healthcare seen, setting. Have you ever seen a situation where a baby tests? Uh, do you t do you test the babies after they're born for COVID? So we do. If um, mom tests positive, so all of our mothers are tested upon admission. So they all come in, whether they're symptomatic or not symptomatic, they are all tested. So not all hospitals may have that capacity. Um, and in that case, they need to prioritize their testing and they may want to uh, prioritize that based on symptomatology. We did that initially. We only tested symptomatic patients. Um, but then we discovered, you know, with the increases in the COVID rates that there was a lot of asymptomatic cases that were not being identified in the community at large. Uh, one of the challenges with testing with just symptomatic patients was uh, that some of the patients were refusing testing because they were afraid of being separated from their baby. So we went, when we went to universal testing, that became part of their um, pre-admission education when they're uh, being followed by their obstetrician so they would understand that universal testing was required for all patients admitted to labor and delivery whether you had symptoms or did not have symptoms. So there was more education um, in the prenatal setting so that they would understand uh, what the signs and symptoms of COVID are. Uh, practitioners were following them for that, assessing them for that, doing telemedicine vis visits were appropriate. In the last month of pregnancy, you, you know, would require ultrasounds or, um, you know, internal exams, so you would be coming into the office. So, of course, in those outpatient settings, trying to really limit uh, the volume of patients in the practices again, to prevent uh, the spread of COVID-19. So part of that education, you know, uh, through telemedicine or inpatient visits is uh, universal testing protocols. So it's not a surprise when they come in that, yes, we're gonna test you for COVID-19. We fortunately um, in our hospital, we're able to get the results pretty quickly. Um, if the mom tests positive, then yes, we will test the baby. So when the patient delivers in labor and delivery, as I described some of the unique scenarios with that, as opposed to a C-section, that's a, a peri-op setting. So now that's a little bit different. Your air exchanges need to be higher. So in a normal patient room, you're looking at uh, greater than six air exchanges per hour in a peri-op setting, uh, greater than 12. So you really wanna assure with your facilities that part of your engineering controls is that your air balancing is correct. Um, not just in those areas, throughout your hospital at large, um, but you now, know, more specific to procedural but, areas. Pardon me, but who, who checks that the air balance is correct? Who facilities. does that job? So that would be facilities. So there's an air direction. They usually have a contractor who can do their air balancing reports for them. They're usually done annually, uh, but if there's any concern that there's a change in the airflow, um, then they can always have their contractors come in and check it again. So there's HEPA filtration that takes place um, and there's directional airflow that takes place. So, um, you know, all of these things need to be, you have to have the correct checked and balances. Uh, and you do this really normally in a peri-op setting, but then you have to consider, oh, mom tested positive. So now this OR is isolated as a COVID OR. So we have our supplies isolated in that OR. Some things stay outside of the room. Some things are inside of the room, depending on your policy and your hospital, how you wanna handle that based on a risk assessment. And that risk assessment will be performed with nursing staff, leadership, uh, physicians, anesthesia. What is it that you have to have in the room absolute at hand's reach? What is it that occasionally you may use that may stay in a cart outside of the room? As an infection professionist of many years, and a lot of experience, as you mentioned, uh -huh. what, uh, what concerned you the most about 
COVID-19 and the uh, neonatal intensive care units. What problems really? Open bay settings. What, what, um, what? Open bay settings. Okay. So a lot of um, intensive care units are designed with open bay settings and limited isolation rooms. So you may have, you know, seven or 10 beds in an open bay and maybe only have one or two isolation rooms. And those isolation rooms would be under negative pressure. But now what happens when you limit the number of isolation rooms you have, perhaps you have two isolation rooms. Perhaps you have two babies whose um, mother tested positive for COVID, so now they have to go into isolation. But now you have another mom who comes in and she's a person under suspicion you have a pending test and she delivers promptly. So now you have a baby who maybe you have to strategize where you're gonna place that baby, you know, perhaps at the end of the bed, closer to the um, uh, isolation rooms waiting for that test result to come back to see because they're under investigation for a possible COVID. So you really kind of have to strategize placement of patients and prioritize those risks. What, what happened when you had more patients who tested positive for COVID-19 and you had isolation rooms? What did you do in that case? Well, that's where you have to strategize. <laughs> you have to really look um, and see what type of are there any aerosol generating procedures? So if the baby's on CPAP or BiPAP, then that may be a greater concern because that's an aerosolizing generating procedure. So you'd wanna put that baby in the isolation room. So um, a baby that comes to you from the infant resuscitation bay and they're already intubated, it's more of a closed setting. The other thing is you may have an isolate, a warmer uh, that is closed. So that's gonna help prevent you know, some of that aerosolization that will happen. So rather than, you know, um, open bassinets. So sounds you may place that baby in an isolate. Sounds like a lot, a lot of challenges there. I mean, I'm always, yeah. I'm also thinking about the bonding that between a mother and child. I mean, yes. uh, how was that, I guess, for in some cases, that wasn't allowed to happen right away, right? That's correct. So um, we require two tests, uh, 24 hours apart to take mom out of isolation. So, um, you know, you, the mom may deliver and may not be able to see the baby initially during that time period while we're trying to rule in or rule out COVID. And if they rule in and baby rolls in, uh, they're gonna be going home very shortly. Mom's gonna be going home and then she's gonna have to follow the um, quarantine initiatives that are put out by the Department of Health before she'll be able to come back and visit with the baby because the babies in an in intensive care unit, their discharge is likely to be delayed due to their health issues. So it becomes very challenging and it's heartbreaking for some of these families. Jenny Hayes, this has been a fascinating conversation. I appreciate you stopping by on infection control today. I, I hope you'll consider stopping by again and give us an update. Uh, okay. so, I, mean, I, hope, I also hope, uh, not to put you on a spot, that you'll consider uh, becoming a member of our editorial advisory board. Uh, Certainly. Think it over. Think it over. That'd be great. Uh, right. Thank you for stopping by. Okay. Thank you, Frank.